it's so lovely to be here and it's so lovely to see uh, those of you who've come back again and some new faces. Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Whitley Awards for International Nature Conservation, or the Green Oscars, as they are now known. Tonight is the culmination of a global search to identify some of the world's most effective grassroots conservation leaders and celebrate their groundbreaking work for wildlife. But first, to start the evening, please welcome on stage the founder of WFN, the extraordinary and wonderful Edward Whitley. Kate, it's always impossible to live up to you, but, but thank you. And thank you very much, Your Royal Highness. Ladies and gentlemen, last year we celebrated our 25th anniversary. And many of you here tonight kindly joined us for our Hope Gala dinner at the Natural History Museum. It was an amazing team effort by the Gala Committee. It was led dynamically, one could say unflinchingly, by Catherine Folkes. And it culminated in a wonderful sight. It culminated in a dozen of our previous winners on stage, arm in arm, and they received a spontaneous standing ovation. And thanks to your generosity, we hit our target. We raised, after all costs, we raised one million pounds, which we're going to reinvest in our winner's network. Now, 25 years, it also felt like a good time to take stock. We commissioned an independent impact assessment report. We worked with Oxford University and we review the impact of our, our winners and their projects. And there are some extraordinary and uplifting statistics which put in context the work which you've kindly funded. Now, we have 200 or so winners, and they work across some 80 countries. They are the leading national and international conservationists, and they're spearheading projects to protect the natural world and to save wildlife. And they're inspiring, educating, and mentoring the younger generation. Now, collectively, our winners have increased protection over some 90 million hectares. Now, this includes land, sea, and fresh water. And to give you an idea of that scale, that equates to about four times the size of the UK. I can't, I've been told not to round these numbers, so they are very accurate. 69% of our winners report that in their project sites, threats have been reduced and that populations of wildlife are either stable or increasing. And 79% of our winners report that on winning a Whitley Award, they receive increased media attention in their countries. So take Panima, for example. She's from the state of Assam in India. Panima won her award in 2017. She returned home to a media flurry. She went around all the schools in Assam. She secured their support. She brought in the chief of police. She was honored by the state governor of Assam and then by the president of India. Panima has been named among the top 10 environmental leaders in India by the Women's Times. Now, for the current election, her reputation is such that she's been chosen by the Electoral Commission as a state icon to encourage ethical voting. And doing all this, a record number of people have also joined her campaign to save the Hargilla stork. And I hope that Lynn Shears and her family, who provided her award back in 2017, have still got those wonderful Hargilla staffs, which started it all off. Now, off the back of our awards, our winners often manage to raise further funds, and this is, this is leverage. Take Hime from Bolivia. We received an email from her this morning, and she recalls, when I started 18 years ago, my first grant was from Parks in Peril, $1,500. In 2016, Chester supported me with $8,000, and then you gave me the biggest grant I've ever got. Since then, I got what I call the Whitley effect. We won a Darwin Award, we won a PNUD, Three of my students received National Geographic Awards. In total, we've now raised 750,000 pounds for our charitable work. She then... <laughs> she then does a PS. PS, enjoy the day. You guys are changing the lives of these new conservationists and keep up the salsa. <laughs> So the recognition is a vital part of their success. It helps open all kinds of doors. And of course, some of these doors are doors to each other, because now about half our winners are collaborating both within and across national boundaries, joining forces for conservation. Now, one step away from this work, at the heart of this charity, 
I'd highlight that nothing in this impact assessment report would have happened without the dedication and drive of our team. And it starts right at the top of the charity, where we're most honoured that Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal tonight marks the 20th year of her patronage. And during... And during these 20 years, Her Royal Highness has not missed a single ceremony. She's visited our winners in Brazil, Croatia, Colombia, Malaysia, Ghana. And her presence, that signature photograph taken with our winners with their trophies, that invariably makes front page news in whichever country is concerned. So thank you for this long term commitment. It, I think in a nutshell, ma'am, you magically transform the funds that we give from being just normal checks into being these coveted awards. So thank you so much. And our other trustee, Sir David Attenborough, for 15 years now, David's been kind enough to narrate our films. The, the films are made by Icon, and you'll see them tonight. David always listens intently to our winners, and he generously gives us his most precious commodity, which is his, his time. Talking of time and commitment, after some 14 years, our director, Georgina, she's moved on, and we thank Georgina, who, with great determination and flair, has built up the charity and built upon the foundations which were originally laid by Louise. And we're delighted that Danny Parks has taken over the role after being with us for just eight years. So. <laughs> and looking ahead, next year, next year world leaders, they come together in China to review and set international targets for wildlife conservation. These targets need to be bold. Urgent action is required from politicians, from industry, from the public to tackle global warming and to protect wildlife. And it's not too late to turn things around. Our winners prove this to us each day. So whether you're Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old Swedish schoolgirl, whether, you whether you're Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, whether you're David Asper, with the wisdom and his experience of almost 100 years of life on Earth, we must all care about the future. How we set about it is down to each of us. But from now on, we really must all count as environmental campaigners. And the new series, Our Planet, which is made by our very own ambassador, Alistair Fothergill, highlights that solutions to the problem, they lie with human decisions. And many of our winners are involved in the making of this series. They're not on screen, but if you turn the camera around, they're the ones who are taking the lead behind the scenes to protect wild areas in conjunction with the local people. As I hope you see, we are very joined up with our winners. We're regularly in touch, whether it's scientific papers they might be about to publish or whether it's just day-to-day -day chat. It's uplifting and it's transporting to receive a quick WhatsApp in the morning from a winner such as Munir in Kenya. On a rainy gray day, it can just make it all worthwhile, even if it's a little different from our own office. Which brings us back to Kate. Thank you so much for comparing this evening. Thank you for everything you've done over the year. With our Hope Gala, you broke new ground. You really raised the roof and you introduced us to a whole circle of new donors. And the challenge now for us is to keep that bar high, but thank you, thank you so much. And thank you all here, one and all, for your most generous support. Let's enjoy this evening as a celebration of these fantastic winners and welcome with us tonight. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Edward, and I am so, so very proud to be one of WFN's ambassadors because it is such a phenomenally effective charity that is expert in finding and supporting local leaders who are best placed to deliver conservation in their home countries. The Whitley Awards champion environmental heroes who lead projects with passion, using the best available science to guide their actions, and through them, fund work centered in community involvement. And that's really key, bringing in communities, helping and supporting the communities, as well as habitats, as well as wildlife. And indeed, the people you'll meet tonight are the ones who are doing everything in their power to ensure the future of this wonderful world of ours. This year's winners have been taking part in an action-packed week. 
They've been grilled by our judging panel. They've met donors and NGOs. They've been interviewed by the media and will receive training in communications, conflict resolution, and project monitoring. All of this is designed to help them make the most of the increased visibility that comes with receiving a Whitley Award and provide them with the tools needed to scale up their work. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our six new Whitley Award winners, who will each receive, thanks to your generous donations, £40,000 in project funding to support protection of endangered species and their habitats. So our first 2019 Whitley Award winner, I'm delighted to announce, is Vatsu Rakuton just, I'm going to try that again, because I have been practicing. <laughs> and I'm going to jolly well get it right, because apparently David Attenborough struggled too. <laughs> Vatsu comes from Madagascar, a beautiful, beautiful island with absolutely impossible surnames. <laughs> Rakuton Drasafe. Is that right? <laughs> And Vatsu has been leading a nationwide movement to safeguard Madagascar's marine resources. Madagascar is the fourth largest island in the world and one of the most important biodiversity hotspots. It's thought to have been isolated from other land masses for 80 million years. 90% of the animal and plant species here are found nowhere else on Earth. Its coastline runs for over 5,000 kilometers and the majority of Madagascar's population rely on the ocean to survive. Coastal resources are being rapidly depleted and there are currently few marine management systems in place. Batsu Rakutun Drasafe is the national coordinator of the Mihari Network, a platform set up to bring fishing communities and organizations together to safeguard marine resources and wildlife. Mihari represents the voices of small-scale fishers in Madagascar. And uh, we also build the capacity of those communities in terms of management to allow those communities to be independent in uh, conservation. Mihari is an opportunity for them to address together the issues. Mihari has been working with subsistent fishers, helping them to create management guidelines and give them a voice in the future of their coastal waters. The sustainable management of Madagascar's fisheries resources need coastal communities. We need to empower them because they are the guardians of the ocean. They've lived there for their entire life, so we need to value their traditional knowledge. The network has grown into one of the largest civil movements in Madagascar, defending fishers' rights as they are some of the most vulnerable people in the country. With her Whitley Award, Vatsu will expand operations to cover 12 of Madagascar's coastal regions. She will work with government partners to deliver policy reform and support communities to manage marine resources for a more sustainable future. Salama Daole. Good evening, everyone. When I was a little girl, my ambition was to become a lawyer to defend people. But unfortunately, this plan fell short when I failed the law exam at the university. <laughs> <laughs> However, today, I'm the lawyer of fishing communities in Madagascar, representing their voices and defending their rights at national and international level. And this is beyond my wildest dreams. I'm quite sure the majority of you knows Madagascar since the movie. 
Is that right? I like to move it, move it. Yeah, I like to? Thank you. As well as lemurs. But today, I want to present a different side of Madagascar. It is a wonderful island, but where coastal communities are among the poorest and the most isolated people in the world. And uh, the Mihari network is the hope of those fishing communities. We have managed to break that isolation and to give those fishing communities a voice, a loud voice. Madagascar's traditional fishers are amazing people. They know more than any of us about marine resources, and they are the guardians of the sea. And we need to recognize their work. Locally managed marine areas are the future of a sustainable and resilient marine resources. They can protect marine wildlife, improve food security, combat poverty, and help coastal communities to adapt to climate change. They need to be replicated around the world. The Whitley Award will allow us to achieve our ambitions through training community leaders to better manage marine resources and work with government for policy reform. I'm dedicating this award to all LMMA communities in Madagascar who are the champions of marine conservation and they need my support and your support. I'm alone on stage today, but I have behind me the World Mihari team, our partners and funders, and they have made all of those achievements possible. So, thank you. Thank you, Vatsu. When you're done in Madagascar, if you could take on the rest of the world, that would be great. <laughs> Our next speaker is Jose Sarasola, who is using the magnificent Chaco Eagle as a flagship for the conservation of Argentina's pampas grasslands. Jose Sarasola grew up in the Pampas region of Argentina. His first encounter with a Chaco Eagle was seeing a dead individual tied to a post by a rancher. It was meant as a warning to other eagles to keep away from their livestock. This shocking image was the motivation for him to begin a lifelong commitment to save the species. It had been 25 years since the bird was last studied, and so José set about identifying the plight of this species. He found that the Chaco Eagle was in trouble. On talking to local gauchos, he discovered that they still mistakenly believed that the eagles were a threat to their young livestock and they confessed to killing raptors where they could. Jose also found that new problems for the Chaco's bird life had emerged, including electrocution from overhead power lines and drowning in sheer-sided water storage tanks commonly used by ranchers throughout this semi-arid landscape. All these factors combined were responsible for the deaths of almost 70% of the young eagles we target during the last years. Jose founded the Center for the Study and Conservation of Birds of Prey in Argentina and began a series of educational campaigns working towards a goal of community-based conservation. The initial results have been overwhelmingly positive. Today, many of La Pampa's gauchos have not only stopped persecuting the Chaco Eagle, but are committed to its protection Wildlife-friendly pylons have been installed and rescue ramps have been fitted in 60 cattle tanks, halving fatalities from drowning. We plan to scale up to a broader region the education campaigns 
and the implementation of the mitigation measures to drastically reduce the mortality of Chaco eagles and other wildlife species in these habitats. With his Whitley Award, José will expand his campaign to a total of 20,000 square kilometers within the Argentinian provinces of La Pampa and Mendoza, giving the Chaco Eagle a new chance to soar. I was born and grew up in La Pampa, the place that also has the most beautiful sunsets in the world. Like many of you, I enjoyed living in close contact with nature since my early childhood. When I, when I was not in school or playing football with my friends, I used to go to the countryside or camp during weekends with my Boy Scout group. I started working with Birds of Prey soon after my graduation, and then in particular with the Chaco Eagle. This bird is found across arid and semi-arid habitats of South America. These ecosystems are very fragile and cover a great portion of our planet. Although not always considered that way, they hold a great diversity of amazing species. The Willaguar will allow us to protect not only the endangered Chaco Eagle, but also other wildlife species in these habitats. To do this, it is imperative to work in collaboration with local people. Education and engagement of the locals, particularly children, is key in almost any nature conservation initiative. New generations represent the future, and they also embody the fate of the nature we want to preserve. For this reason, it is fantastic to see so many young people here in this room tonight. Our fight against species extinctions and habitat loss on time seems to be an impossible task. But by joining each of our individual efforts together, I am confident we will be able to solve this worldwide nature crisis we are facing. It is up to us, both the Whitley Award winners, but you, the Whitley Fund for Nature and its supporters, to work together to make this possible. I would like to thank to the, all the people that helped and worked uh, on this project for so many years, but especially to my parents, Alicia and Jose Antonio. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, and what a wonderful vision, which I hope will come to pass. And now we travel to Ghana to hear from Caleb Ofari Boateng, who is working to bring back the aptly named Whistling Frog back from the brink of extinction. This is the Togo Slippery Frog. For nearly 40 years, it was thought to be extinct by scientists, but it's not. In 2005, on a research expedition in eastern Ghana, conservationists Caleb Ofori Wotang and his team found a population of slippery frogs living in the remote rainforests of the Togo Volta Highlands. Caleb recognised that without rapid intervention, they would soon be back on the list of extinctions. The species that I loved so much was in a, a very big trouble, and uh, there was really uh, nothing being done about it. And so he decided to put a plan in place to safeguard their future. Today, the frogs are threatened by hunting and deforestation the same threats that supposedly wiped them out years ago. Caleb founded Herp Ghana, West Africa's first amphibian conservation society, to address these twin challenges. If I didn't do anything about it, nothing would have been done, and so I, I had to do this. But the job for Herp Ghana has not been an easy one. 
It's said that the people of the Togo Volta Highlands moved to the region 5,000 years ago specifically because of this rainforest's edible frogs. Changing those long-established ways has taken time. Caleb's team have made remarkable progress. They've been training local behaviour change champions to raise awareness and reduce consumption. Caleb has grand plans for his Whitley Award. His team will ramp up their education work and implement a suite of conservation measures, including restoration of degraded amphibian habitat and the creation of a 60 square kilometre community protected area to bring this species back from the brink. Thank you very much. I was born and raised in Ghana's protected areas. My father was a park warden, and so I spent most of my childhood running about the West African savannas and chasing baboons sometimes. <laughs> I remember nights when lions would roar right in our backyard. When I was seven, I lost my father, who was only 45 years old. My father loved me dearly, and I often wondered if there was anything I could do to bring him back. My father had big plans for wildlife conservation in Ghana. But unfortunately, he has ceased to exist in the line of his duty. He became extinct. And none of his plans to save species materialized. When I think of species extinction, I think of my father. I think of losing a dear loved one with no possibility of ever having him back. And this is why halting species extinction has been one of my life's passion. Since 2005, I've been doing everything I can to give the Togo slippery frog a fighting chance to survive. This frog is dear to me for many reasons, one of which is its unique whistling calls, which goes like this. I always look forward to this call anytime I'm in the rainforest. And as a matter of fact, my rainforest experience is never complete without hearing this call. When my two little girls, Lois and Eunice, grew up, I want them to have the opportunity to hear this call as well. And with this weekly award, I have the opportunity to make this happen. I will be able to significantly expand the area of forests protected for this species and to partner with communities to reduce its consumption. I would like to dedicate this award in memory of my father and other eco-warriors who have paid the ultimate price protecting wildlife and forest. I do believe that protecting the planet requires of us all to make changes and we all must do the best that we can. Thank you. I'm going to take issue with one thing that you said, Caleb. I don't think your father is extinct. He would, be, he would be astonishingly proud of what you're doing in his memory. Our next speaker is Nikolai Petkov, whose project spans Bulgaria's fragile coastal wetlands and their extraordinary bird life. For the last 40 years, every winter, 
the coastal wetlands of the Black Sea have hosted a magnificent event. Thousands of birds arrive to rest, feed, and spend the winter here after their 6,000 kilometer migration from the Russian Arctic. But things are changing, and the wintering grounds of lakes Shabla and Durankulak in northeastern Bulgaria could soon be lost forever. Infrastructure and development projects put the survival of these threatened geese at risk, while illegal hunting and fishing disturbs roosting sites. Nikki Petkov and his team at the Bulgarian Society for the Protection of Birds are working to prevent the destruction of this haven, change negative perceptions towards conservation, and raise awareness of poorly known wildlife laws and their enforcement. We always try to balance in our work the conservation needs of the birds and the interests of the local people. By educating farmers, hunters, police and policy makers who hold the future of these wetlands in their hands, Nikki is gradually reversing the trend and building local pride. We worked with the farmers to solve issues of crop damages. We worked with the hunters to reduce the poaching and illegal killing. Working with the local authorities to ensure that the development that happens in the future is done in a way and places that they cause the least damage to the birds and their feeding grounds. And of course we work with the local community to raise their awareness of the natural heritage they have. With an ambitious building proposal for the municipality and conception, Nicky will use his Whitley Award to ensure nature conservation becomes a mainstream part of development planning and generates opportunities for ecotourism. This timely project will create a blueprint for cooperation that could be applied wherever wetland habitat and human expansion are in conflict. Now we work to replicate and find solutions similar to this in other countries along the flyway. I have been passionate about wildlife since I was a little boy, and this made me to join the Bulgarian RSPB when I was just 15 years old. I quickly got into wetlands, places always brimming with birds and wildlife. And seven years later, I saw my first red-breasted geese flying through the early mist in the morning at Durankulak Lake. It is a goose that depends a lot on humans to survive. In the mid-20th century, the conversion of wheat crops into cotton fields along the Caspian Sea forced the geese to seek alternative wintering grounds, and they almost went extinct. An example how easily men could wipe out a species from the face of the earth. Nowadays, the global population concentrates for wintering in Bulgaria. One would think that it's safe and easy to solve the problems in a EU member state, but it's not. Big money is more powerful than legislation, and urban development is always a threat. In addition, hunting and disturbance from illegal fishing in roosting wetlands drives the geese and deprives them from safe wintering. And poachers are as aggressive as anywhere in the world. Just three months ago, our field car of the team has been shot at by poachers, and this seriously disrupted our work. Luckily, no one was injured, but my belief is that no conservationist should fear for their life. With the Whitley Awards, the geese will continue to find safe feeding places and roosting lakes in Bulgaria, but we also want to help to ensure that the geese migrate safely from Russia through Kazakhstan and Ukraine and into Romania and Bulgaria in collaboration with our partners in these countries. 
In the last few years, it has been hard for conservationists in Bulgaria, and awards like this are recognition of the importance of the work that our staff and volunteers do. It boosts our morale and also gives resolve to continue our efforts. Thank you. Extraordinary dedication and bravery indeed. Thank you, Nikki. Now to Latin America, as we hear from our next winner, Elena Zanelli, Zanella, sorry, whose passion for marine life is turning the tide for Costa Rica's hammerhead sharks. I'm so passionate about my work because I love hammerhead sharks. When I was in the water with them, I felt so grateful for the experience, but at the same time, I felt commitment to them. I felt that I need to do something for them. Ten years ago, Elena Zanella began tagging sharks in the Golfo Dulce, Costa Rica. This part of the country's Pacific coast was rumored to be a hammerhead breeding ground. But until Elena's tagging, no one knew just how important it was. Elena discovered that Golfo Dulce is an essential coastal nursery for juvenile hammerheads. Until then, conservation efforts had largely focused on offshore sites where adult sharks congregate during their migration. The Eastern Tropical Pacific Corridor connects migratory shark populations in Costa Rica, Ecuador, Colombia and Panama, forming a shark swimway. Armed with her research, Elena began working with fellow Whitley Award alumni in these countries to strengthen protection for hammerheads throughout their life cycle, from juvenile through to adulthood. When Elena's NGO, Mission Tuberon, began research, the towns around Golfo Dulce were busy fishing ports, and hammerhead ceviche was on the menu in many restaurants. A decade later, their work with fishing communities has begun to pay off. The government recognized our work, declared the wetlands of Golfo Dulce as the Scaloped Harmahead Shark Sanctuary. The first shark sanctuary in Costa Rica and the first shark sanctuary dedicated to a nursery area in the world. Elena will use her Whitley Award to work with fishing communities and authorities to reduce illegal practices which threaten juvenile hammerhead survival, as well as establish an educational station to engage children and young people in conservation and inspire other countries in this vital marine corridor to protect their precious natural resources. I would like that people felt proud about this shark sanctuary and they respect and protect it. As an undergraduate student, I visited Cocos Island. There, I saw a hammerhead shark for the first time. I remember there was a great number of illegal fishing gears at that time in the island, confiscated by the rangers. There was a sign at the park entrance that said, how many sharks do we have in our oceans? Each day less and less. This experience changed my life. I went back to the university determined to study the conservation of Harmahead shark. It is here that I met 2004 Whitley Award Randall Arouse, and we began working together. I visited several fishing communities, and I saw that the fishing of juvenile Harmaheads was taking place all along the coast without any restriction. 
you don't need to be a great scientist to understand that if, you, if we do not protect the juveniles today, we will not have adults in the future. In 2009, together with Andres Lopez, my life and work partner, I founded the NGO Mission Tiburon, dedicated to identifying a nursery area for this endangered species. Thanks to this Whitley Award, we will be able to collect more robust scientific data and involve the communities in the protection of these sharks. I would like to thank the collaborators and the team of Mission Tiburon, especially my partner, Andres, for joining me in this journey. Thanks to Randall Arauz, who inspired me to fight for our oceans and our sharks. Oceans with sharks are healthy oceans. This is my vision for the future. Andres and I have a six-year daughter. Her name is Amber. In the future, I hope that we can take her to Cocos Island, maybe when she is 16. And I hope that she will see the hammerheads that inspire my life in a healthy ocean. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena, and I think uh, that what you have summed up so beautifully is um, what WFN does so effectively, which is encourage collaboration, working together with other scientists, uh, with other conservationists, and I really believe that Amber will get to see a healthy ocean when she's 16. <clears throat> Our final speaker is Wendy Tamariska, who is leading a community conservation project to revive local traditions and safeguard Borneo's orangutan. Gunung Palung National Park and the surrounding landscape in West Kalimantan is home to approximately 5,000 Bornean orangutan. This population is considered the best hope of survival for this critically endangered great ape. Much has been made of the plight of orangutans and their flight for survival in an area decimated by palm oil production and illegal logging. This forest is important not only for the orangutan and the plethora of other wildlife, but for local communities who live in the vicinity of the national park. Wendy Tamariska has identified an innovative approach that could bolster protection efforts. As a member of the indigenous Bornean Dayak community, Wendy grew up understanding the importance of balancing the needs of people with that of conservation. As a sustainable livelihoods manager for the Gunung Palung Orangutan Conservation Programme, he is enabling communities to live in a financially and environmentally sustainable way. Having gained buy-in from government and local communities, Wendy has established a secure market to support the sale of non-timber products by traditional artisans and organic farmers. And it's working. Those involved with the programme have agreed to halt illegal logging in exchange for livelihood support. They have taken what they have learned from us and are using those skills to expand their business which to me is the true mean of success. Thanks to this Whitley Award, Wendy and his team will now extend their model to more remote reaches of the National Park. I want to build their capacity so we all can have a better understand the importance of orangutans and the rainforest so we can all be together to preserve it.
Thank you for this very special opportunity. It means a lot to me. I was born and raised in Borneo. So when I was a little kid, there was a lot of giant trees around my village. And I saw orangutans regularly. I left to go to the city to become a teacher. But when I went back home to my village, everything had changed. The giant trees and the orangutans were gone. I don't know if my boy, Al, will be able to see them one day, or if it'll just be a story for him and his kids in the future. My home and the home of the orangutan is rapidly changing due to palm oil expansion, mining, and illegal logging. I personally believe that the key to protecting our rainforest from further destruction is with support from the government and by working with local communities. That is why I partner with people such as illegal loggers and miners and teach them how to make money without destroying the forest. Hopefully, we can make Borneo green again. With support from the Wheatley Fund for Nature, I will expand my work into new communities that rarely receive livelihood support or formal education to protect orangutans and their habitat. I want to dedicate this award to my family, the Gunung Palung Orangutan Conservation Program, and of course, the local communities in West Borneo. Without them, I would not be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. And I think uh, Wendy's story, again, really emphasizes um, why uh, the WFN approach of supporting local conservationists is so effective and really works. Thank you. Wildlife conservation can so often feel like a losing battle. But these awards always give me, and I know a lot of you as well, uh, a renewed sense of conservation optimism. The natural world is facing substantial challenges. We all know that. And how we choose to act over the next decade will have far-reaching implications for the planet's ecosystems, for people, and for wildlife. But as our winners demonstrate, there are many positive stories to celebrate. And what WFN does so effectively is help great conservationists to work collaboratively, to join up their work, to share ideas and expertise, to make a bigger and more long-term impact. I like to think of the WFN network as literally being a net, a safety net for our world. And now to hand out the trophies to our new, incredibly inspiring conservation champions. I'd like to welcome on stage to present the awards, the patron of the Whitley Fund for Nature for 20 years, Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal. So our first Whitley Award this evening is the Whitley Award donated by the Savitri Warney Charitable Trust. And the winner is Vatso Rakaton Drasafe. The next Whitley Award is the Whitley Award donated by the Badenoch uh, Fund, and the winner is Jose Sarasola.
Our next award is the Whitley Award, donated by the Corcoran... Uh, sorry. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, by the Corcoran uh, Foundation, and the winner is Caleb Afore Boetting. Our fourth award is the Whitley Award donated by the William Brake Charitable Trust in memory of William Brake. And the winner is Nikolai or Nikki Petkoff. Our next award is the Whitley Award donated by the Garfield Western Foundation and the winner is Elena Zanella. And our final award is the Whitley Award donated by the Arcus Foundation, and the winner is Wendy Tamariska. So very, very well done to our 2019 Whitley Award winners. Receiving a Whitley Award is a moment of great achievement, but this is just the start of your journey. Change doesn't happen overnight, and it requires sustained commitment, not just from our winners, but from all of us. WFN stays in touch with the winners, repeat, uh, repeat funding them via its continuation funding program. And over half of all Whitley Award alumni have gone on to win multi-year continuation funding grants, which are worth up to £100,000. And this is where I think the charity is having the biggest impact. And it provides a vital lifeline, as our continuation funding winners will tell you themselves in these next films. Now, just a little warning, they were filmed on location, and both locations were quite windy. Um, so this is stories direct from the field. Hi, I'm Randall Eddowes, Whitley Fund for Nature Gold winner 2004. Right now I'm on board the Shark Water uh, Research Vessel for Highly Migratory Species, and I want to take this opportunity to tell you about the importance of long-term funding. Effective conservation requires the full involvement and participation of the communities that interact with these endangered species, and it must be based on sound science. Now, of course, you can't go to one of these communities and do a talk and expect everyone to change. These are long-term processes, and it's the same thing with the science required to study the, the migratory movements of these animals. They take years to do, and they take years to publish. Now, take your community support and take your science and approach your politicians and try to attain change in public policy. And that's where the real trick is at. And thanks to the long-term support of the Whitley Fund for Nature, I've been able to do just that, have an impact on marine conservation policy in a domestic, global, and regional fashion. So thank you very much, Whitley Fund for Nature.
Hi everyone, my name is Shivani Bala. I was a Whitley Fund for Nature Award winner in 2014. What an incredible difference receiving the Whitley Award has made to us. We were then at a time where we were working with young Samburu warriors in this landscape encouraging them to stop killing lions, becoming lion ambassadors to prevent lion conflict and really promoting coexistence between lions and people in northern Kenya. A couple of years later we received the continuation funding. I can't emphasize enough what that's done to us. We know the challenges towards lion conservation are increasing. Lions are facing so many more threats than they've ever had to face before and having that long-term continued support allowed us to plan, engage other warriors across this network. We have warriors working across the river there in that conservancy. We have warriors here just behind me working here. We have warriors behind the hills there, warriors in that area and this incredible network of having warriors engaged in conservation is what's made a massive difference to lion conservation in northern Kenya. We couldn't have done this without that continuation funding. It was not possible and to have the Whitley Fund for Nature invest in continuation funding is incredible and has just made the biggest difference for lions. So thank you so much. Thank you for believing in us and our network of warriors. We have this incredible network thanks to you. So as you can see, continuation funding works and we are extremely grateful to the generous donors who've chosen to give exclusively to continuation funding, which is limited only by what we can raise each year. Now, as Edward said earlier, our Hope Gala aimed to boost funds available to past winners through this continuation funding program, including Shivani and Randall, who you've just heard from. And thanks to the support of so many of you, we hit our target of a million pounds. And that is an extraordinary achievement for which I thank you from the absolute bottom of my heart. But, <laughs> you know the drill. I mean, imagine what we could do with another million. <laughs> I'll leave you to think about that. One of the most exciting things for me is that our pool of 200 winners grows as, uh, sorry, I've, just I've written the notes here and I can't read my own writing, um, that as our pool of 200 winners grow, we are building an extraordinary worldwide network of dedicated scientists and conservationists who rather than working in isolation, now have the support encouragement and backing of peers in every part of the world. And in fact, some of our past winners are here with us tonight, including Permina from India, Melvin from Borneo, Makala from Tanzania, and Dino from Kenya. True conservation heroes and um, great, great ambassadors for just what WFN can help uh, achieve. Um, we're going to move on now to tonight's top prize. It's the Whitley Gold Award. It's worth £60,000 and it is donated by friends of WFN. It recognises a previous winner who's made an outstanding contribution to nature. The Gold Award really represents the pinnacle of the WFN journey, with the recipient being a past Whitley Award winner who's also received continuation funding and has achieved considerable things for conservation internationally. The Gold winner joins the Whitley Awards judging panel as well as acting as a mentor to the new winners during the awards week. And new for this year, the Gold winner will also collaborate with other Whitley Award winners on their project, working together to maximise their impact. And it's this approach that sets WFN apart and makes the support it gives so meaningful. So let's see who takes this amazing gold award this year.
yellow-shouldered parrots. These chicks are just two weeks old. Their feathers are beginning to come through. Soon, they will be ready to leave this nest. But will they get the chance? Margarita Island is known to be the largest and most biologically diverse among the Venezuelan Caribbean islands, with the majority of its wildlife found on the western Macanao Peninsula. This magnificent place is a threatened species hotspot and home to Venezuela's most endangered parrot, the aptly named yellow-shouldered parrot. Poaching of chicks for the pet trade is rife, and loss of habitat almost led to their extinction on Margarita, until their plight came to the attention of John Paul Rodriguez. The 2003 Whitley Award winner embarked on a mission to protect this charismatic bird. John Paul co-founded Provita, an NGO which has spent the last 30 years working to safeguard not only the yellow-shouldered parrot, but all endangered species in Venezuela. Initially, when we started working with the parrot, we focused on reproductive biology and on controlling poaching. So we were very successful at taking areas of research, protecting the nests, and making sure that all the parrots that were in our nests flew every year. Provita is working with communities and local authorities to tackle poaching and restore natural habitat. Ex-hunters have been offered an alternative livelihood and joined a team of eco-guardians committed to protecting parrot nests to boost their chances of breeding success. As a result of his multifaceted approach, numbers of yellow-shouldered parrots are finally on the rise. We have taken the population from about 650 parrots when they started working in the late 80s, early 90s, and now it's about 1,700, so we tripled the population. Despite success, trade in this desirable bird is still a problem on Margarita. At present, we have 1,700 in the wild in Macanao, but there are at least 3,000 in people's homes. So it's a, it's a big difference. It's a very strong pressure on the parrot survival. Elsewhere throughout their range, yellow-shouldered parrots have declined and even faced local extinction. But John Paul will never give up on the parrot. After receiving his Whitley Award in 2003, John Paul gained the attention of the IUCN, and today he is the elected chair of the Species Survival Commission, the first person from outside Europe or North America to hold this position. He has increasingly become part of the international conservation community. These connections have allowed him to test new approaches locally whilst contributing to global species conservation and environmental policy. John Paul's Whitley Gold Award will focus on developing the first conservation action plan for this parrot, protecting it across its entire range. John Paul will join forces with other Whitley Award winners to review the project in Macanao and develop a holistic strategy that benefits both people and parrots. We believe that now it's time to take a bigger look at the picture and start working on the social aspects of it, trying to understand how we can find ways to turn around this tradition of having parrots as pets. The support of the Whitley Fund for Nature is crucial at a time when social and economic crisis in Venezuela is forcing conservation into the background. Despite these overwhelming pressures, with a leader like John Paul at the helm, Provita gives us reason to be optimistic about the future. Wow, well, thank you. Your Royal Highness, Whitley Fund for Nature friends, ladies and gentlemen. I don't think you understand 
how important this award is to me. I mean, like Kate said, we all know Whitley Awards are the Green Oscars. Being here is a major planetary honor and the product of dozens of people collaborating decades to save a species for, from extinction. Today we can say it has worked. We have more than doubled the parrot population, successfully restored dry habitats, dry habitats and engage local communities, exporters, miners, and government throughout the entire process. I'm deeply grateful to my devoted, professional, and infinitely passionate team for a joint success. The first time that I stood here was 16 years ago, wearing the same suit. <laughs> I still fit in it, which is quite <laughs> unmarked. <laughs> the 2003 award came at a critical time to our project. We had undergone a major poaching event and our infrastructure was compromised. The substantial amount provided by the Whitley Award co combined with several continuation funding over the years strongly helped us consolidate a team, rebuild our field and office facilities, integrate local communities, and, and importantly, reduce poaching rates, protect breeding habitat, and increase the parrot population. But when I say that this award is important to me. I mean much more than that. The Whitley, the, the Whitley Fund for Nature continued to invest in Venezuela when many others left. 20 years ago, most big international conservation organizations had offices in the country. After all, we're one of the 17 mega diverse countries in the world. These organizations channel funds, hired people, and contributed to the national conservation discussion. They inspired students to pursue a career in conservation. They provided training opportunities, internships, short-term jobs. Well, I realize that keeping an office in Venezuela, given our social and economic situation, you've seen the news today and recently, and you know what I'm talking about, is an uphill battle. Whitley Fund for Nature support demonstrates, however, that targeted investment, easily within the reach of any conservation organization, disbursed through local players, can make a huge difference, even at the worst of times. There's no need to have an office in every biodiverse country when you can identify local partners, invest a smaller amount of funds than needed to hire expats, and build a long-term sustainable initiative. In addition to my work in Provita, I spend time as an ecology professor at the Venezuelan Institute for Scientific Investigation and as chair of the UCN Species Survival Commission. An issue that keeps coming back, both in my academic and my conservation career, is that the highest biodiversity and conservation need happen at the places where there are fewer trained professionals and, and fewer resources available to address them. This is why I call the biodiversity paradox. To me, what the Whitley Awards do to help balance this paradox is what makes them more important. As a Gold Award winner, I'm able to collaborate with the impressive network of winners to reflect on the paradox and how we can increase capacity and investment in biodiversity-rich countries. Much, much more money is spent on destroying nature than on protecting it. But we conservationists know how to do conservation. Many examples of conservation success exist. The six that we heard about tonight are just an example of that. So to prevent extinction, we need to have the right people, in the right place, at the right time. To achieve this, we need to bolster local players that can have the highest impact for nature conservation. Thank you so much. simply nothing to add to that.
If you get a chance to speak to John Paul later, and I heartily urge you to do so, um, although you might be mobbed, um, he is the embodiment of conservation optimism. Thank you, John Paul. And I'd now uh, like to ask Her Royal Highness to say a few words. Well, ladies and gentlemen, not for the first time, I, you know, at this stage of the evening and I come to the podium and genuinely, there doesn't seem to me to be any point in saying anything. Um, <laughs> because your winners uh, have said it all in a, in, given that English is not usually their first language, uh, in a most articulate way, and in a way that really underlines everything uh, that the Whitley Fund for Nature was ever set up to do. And it reflects, yes, it reflects a movement in uh, 25 years. I remind you that's also a quarter of a century. It's kind of sounds older. Um, but it reflects what has been learnt in that period of time. But it underlines the difference that individuals make who have the ability to motivate those around them to understand what those issues are and how to deal with them. And the core of what we recognize here is those individuals and their abilities to do exactly that. And many of those have been in, in very different areas. And I, I do honestly question how anybody can fall for a hammerhead shark quite that convincingly. <laughs> But thank goodness somebody has. <laughs> and we are very happy to support them to do that. And all of your work reflects areas which, quite frankly, most people would be scared of uh, to even begin to work in those areas. And I think I would underline that from this year in particular that many of our award winners are bold in the sense of what they've taken on in a social and environmental aspect but they're also extremely brave in the physical sense of the challenges that they face and uh, the challenges they face in where they live and, and who will speak to them at the end of the day. And perhaps that also underlines the, uh, another value of the, the, our funding through the Whitley Fund for Nature and the ability that all of you who contribute to it and did so spectacularly this year uh, as, at, at, the, at the Natural History Museum. It, it underlines the value of independent funding that gives you a choice, gives you the strength to make decisions and do things which would be very, very difficult to do if it came through any other uh, avenue. So maintaining that level of independence, I suspect, is what also adds hugely to the ability of our winners to make a real difference. And that, I hope you realize, is a, not even a backhanded, it's a full-fronted compliment to those who have supported Whitley since those very early days and seen it grow. I think the original award was 15,000. That's quite an improvement. And it's only been done uh, thanks to the huge increase in supporters. And supporters who maintain a level of interest, uh, not just in financial terms, but an in interest in what is happening, what the winners are contributing to, and how those, they continue to make a difference wherever they've been in the world. Effective environmental leadership requires sustained commitment and sustained support. And this first 25 years, which we will also underline, has proven just how important that sustained support really is. I've had the opportunity of meeting some of their winners in their places of work, and others not yet, but I know the environment in which they work. I was in Madagascar last year. And believe you me, that independence of support and understanding for the conditions in which they live, as indeed our Gold Award winner suffers from in a slightly different way, really makes it possible to maintain the sort of work 
that you know needs to be done. The first time I went to Madagascar, there were quite a number of conservation programs on the go, but they didn't have the Whitley funding. It went through a serious downturn since then. I'm hoping that the, this structure of the awards and the award winner and those who can support her will change that uh, for a country like Madagascar. But we recognize that every one of those win winners is, is often working in less than ideal conditions. And your support is not just that financial support. It is about having the very presence and sheer weight of numbers support and understanding that will help them do the, fulfill the roles that they've been talking about tonight. So it's been a huge pleasure to be in part of this journey uh, for only 20 years. Um, I'm, as I say, coming here every year is a humbling experience, knowing just what has been achieved by our individual winners. But I must also underline the, what I think the team at the Whitley Fund has done in terms of not just giving the opportunity for uh, our winners uh, to put their projects forward, but the ability to, to judge, to collect uh, such a wide range of individuals uh, in so many different countries. And I hope that over 20 years, with now over 20, 200 winners, that that is also beginning to pay in terms of the ability to provide support network from real experience from previous winners. But the team here and their, their choices, uh, their decisions, and the support that they build around them uh, in order to give their winners the best possible chance to return home and really make what we can offer them in terms of uh, awards pay in a much more focused way back home, which is where they, they need it. So I think there's a lot to celebrate um, over that 25 years and a lot to look forward to. Now, I know that getting that a million pounds this year was a little out of the ordinary. It did hugely add to our ability to, to do the sort of levels of support that I think you all expect of us now. And I think it would be um, hopefully unacceptable to most of you to reduce our, uh, that bar um, which we have raised. So hopefully you, will be, you can see and you can hear from our winners that they do make extremely good use of the funds that you raise and the support that you offer and that you would really want to be able to offer them certainly not less and possibly more in the future. So thank you. I should think we should take that, all of us, as a royal command. <laughs> thank you, Your Royal Highness, and thank you for your tremendous support for this charity over the last 20 years. And as Her Royal Highness said, we are so grateful for the fundraising success of the 25th anniversary, which enabled us, as she said, to raise the bar for winners. And looking to the future, we do really want to keep that bar high and maintain what we can offer our winners in funding to support really effective wildlife conservation projects right across the world. Congratulations again to six wonderful, inspiring, hope-giving winners. Um, you have done amazing work, and I know you will continue to do so. Thanks, in no small part, to our wonderful donors who make these awards possible. Um, once Her Royal Highness has left, please do join me next door for the reception. Thank you all very much indeed for being part of the Green Oscars of 2019. Good night. <laughs>